What I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, president of the Hodges Business Club. She has worked diligently for the past 18 months uh, to grow and develop the club. Is one of the few people who are responsible for the organization of this event. Uh, she's now the uh, director of sales and marketing for uh, and support for Sky Angels, and will graduate. Congratulations from Hodges with her MBA this December. Please welcome the president of the business club, Felicia Rogers. actually joined the Cato Institute in 1997 and uh, he's currently right now the chairman of the Cato Institute. Um, he is also on the board of the Institute for Justice, the Federalist Society, and George Mason University School of Law. Um, he founded uh, a company called CDA Investment Technologies um, who uh, provides uh, financial information and technologies for businesses. So he has an extensive business background before he joined the Cato Institute. Uh, he has clerked for uh, a U.S. District Court judge in Washington, D.C., and also a U.S. Court of Appeals judge in Washington, D.C. Um, he's also taught law at uh, Georgetown University. And um, he uh, has written extensively, and I know a lot of you, um, I see you walking around with his book uh, that he's going to speak about today. So. Um, you know, his writings have appeared in uh, the New York Times and uh, uh, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. And uh, he's also been on television. You've seen him on news programs such as The O'Reilly Factor um, occasionally. So um, today he's going to talk to us about uh, The Dirty Dozen, how 12 Supreme Court cases radically expanded government and eroded our freedom. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Bob Levy. Pleasure to uh, be with you. I, I spoke last year at the Naples campus. It's the first time I've been out here at Fort Myers campus, and it's wonderful. <clears throat> I don't know what actually could be nicer than being in uh, Southwest Florida in November. Uh, and for me, it's not just being here in, in, in Florida, it's being uh, out of New York and DC, where I spent most of my uh, business career. I grew up in, in Washington, DC, and of course, being in the financial community for uh, the better part of 26 years, I I spent a lot of time in New York, but it's uh, just a heck of a lot friendlier down here in Florida. The last time I was up in New York, I had to get from Wall Street uh, to uh, Grand Central Station. If you don't know the subway system in New York, you can be a little bit confusing. There are local trains and there are express trains. And <clears throat> so I'm down on the subway platform, and uh, I see a guy who looks like he's a native New Yorker, and I uh, knew how friendly New Yorkers were, so I said to him, say, does it matter which one of these trains I take to get up to Grand Central Station? He said, not to me, it doesn't, buddy. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's the difference between uh, folks down here in Florida. That's the New York version of uh, Friendly. Today I'm going to talk about the, the worst Supreme Court cases of the modern era, where the court has either expanded government powers beyond those that are constitutionally authorized or failed to protect rights that are uh, constitutionally uh, secured. Essentially, the court has ignored the document that the framers uh, gave us. Uh, one uh, way to put it, uh, they keep talking about drafting the Constitution for Iraq. Uh, why don't we just give them ours? It was, uh, ours was written by a lot of really smart guys who worked for over 200 years, and we're not using it anymore. <clears throat> and there's some truth to that. And I remember seeing a uh, Tea Party rally that said, uh, the sign said, uh, our Constitution may be flawed, but it's better than what we have now. And so there's a sense in which uh, we have taken this document and we've uh, corrupted it to be something the framers did not intend it to be. Um, before I talk about the uh, uh, cases that I think have done uh, the most damage, um, I'd like to provide some historical framework and a few words on how the Constitution uh, ought to be uh, interpreted. And even on Supreme Court confirmation, since they're going to be a I think a big issue under the next uh, administration, whether it's an Obama administration or uh, a Republican administration. 
So before the, the Constitution, which was ratified, as you may recall, in 1789, there was uh, the Declaration of Independence in 1976. Uh, 1776. So what's the link, if any, between these uh, two documents? And it goes like this. Jefferson wrote in the Declaration that the cardinal truths are these, and this is the quote, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then Jefferson added this, this phrase, and this is the key phrase, to secure these rights, uh, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers uh, from the consent of the government. Now, the important word there is secure. Notice he said to secure these rights. He didn't say to grant these rights. He said secure. You can't secure what you didn't already have. So these are rights that we possessed before the Declaration was written, before the Constitution was written, before the US government was ever formed. You secure rights that you possess, even before these documents uh, became effective. So what's that all mean? It means we're all created equal. Uh, that means no one has rights that are superior to anyone else's rights. And we're born with those rights. We don't get those rights from government. And indeed, whatever powers government has, it comes from us, from the consent of the government. We give the government power. It's not the government that gives us rights. Our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness imply the right to live our lives as we wish, to pursue happiness as we think best, uh, provided only that we respect the, the, the rights of other people to do the same thing. I think that's a very libertarian principle, and we at the Cato Institute uh, are libertarians. And by the way, when I speak of libertarians, I'm not talking about the libertarian political party. We don't endorse candidates, we don't endorse political parties. I'm talking about libertarianism as a political philosophy that focuses on free markets, private property, uh, individual liberty, and strictly uh, limited government. I think it's fair to say that the founders were libertarians. Now, the Declaration speaks of unalienable rights endowed by our Creator. Now, can this reference to a Creator in the Declaration be squared with uh, the Constitution, which, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, you've heard that uh, features a separation between church and state? Uh, there is, in my view, no conflict between those two documents. Thomas Jefferson and several of the framers were what's called deists. That is to say, they believed in God as creator, not necessarily in a God that continues to interact with mankind on a recurring basis. But for constitutional purposes, the important point is this. That belief is irrelevant. Our constitutional framework does not hinge on whether the rights that we had before government was formed came from God or from nature. The important constitutional point is they did not come from the king. Uh, individuals have rights, independent of government, that we had before government was even formed. And our Constitution addresses the relationship between man and government, not the relationship between man and God. That relationship is up to each one of us to pursue as we individually see fit. So the constitutional baseline is that man, and not government, possesses rights. Some of those rights are enumerated in the Bill of Rights. They're not granted by, and they're not taken from, government. Indeed, we, and not government, do the granting. Government has certain powers derived from us, as Jefferson put it, from the consent of the government. We uh, grant specified powers to government for one purpose, to secure our rights. So in a nutshell, we start with these rights, whether they're God-given or they're natural rights, we start with them. We had them before government was formed. And then we protect those rights by delegating limited and enumerated powers uh, to a government that is itself bound by a written constitution. And that constitution, that document, it doesn't separate God from our lives, but it does separate God uh, from government. The Bill of Rights um, was ratified two years later. Constitution 1789 and Bill of Rights in 1791. So why wasn't the Bill of Rights included in the original document? Madison, James Madison, and Hamilton, among others, initially thought that a Bill of Rights would be unnecessary. And the reason they thought that is because they argued that rights, like the ones that you now see in the Bill of Rights, like, for example, the right to a free press, they didn't have to be guaranteed. Why not? Because the Constitution set up a government of enumerated powers. 
And it was understood that if the powers weren't contained in the Constitution, the government didn't have the powers. So you wouldn't need a Bill of Rights to secure, for example, the right to a free press because there was no power in the Constitution for the government to take away the right to a free press. There was no power for the government to interfere with a free press. And if there's no power, then of course, Madison argued, we don't need a right that protects against the infringement of that uh, power. So a Bill of Rights, in his view, was unnecessary. He was also concerned that if you miss certain rights in a Bill of Rights, that might be misconstrued. It might be misinterpreted by readers of the Constitution to mean that we only had the rights that were listed. But we didn't have any rights other than those that were specifically listed. Now, Madison took care of that problem by adding the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution. And the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration of certain rights in the Constitution should not be construed to mean that those are all the rights that we have. We have lots of other rights. And again, he used the word that we retain. And of course, you can't retain what you didn't already have. Another indication that we had those rights even before the Constitution was written. It would not be possible to list each and every right that the founders um, determined that we had. And so that's why they added the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration of certain rights does not mean that those are the only rights uh, we had. Now, ultimately, Madison switched sides. And while he originally thought the Bill of Rights would not be necessary, he joined later the Anti-Federalists in supporting a Bill of Rights. But the reason he did so was just as an extra added precaution. He still believed that because the Constitution only gives the government certain powers, you wouldn't need a right to protect against the exercise of a power that didn't exist. But he understood without the promise of a Bill of Rights, the Constitution itself might not have been ratified. There were some states that were very resistant unless the Bill of Rights uh, were to be included. Strictly speaking, I think it's fair to say that the rights secured under the Bill of Rights were already secured because of the structure of the Constitution limiting the power of the US government. So what are the theories of, the, uh, of constitutional interpretation? How should we interpret uh, the document? The two most important theories that you've probably read a good deal about because there's so much controversy are what's called textualism and the theory of the living Constitution. Now you may have heard some other terms, so I wanna just take a moment to define a few terms and to dispel some misconceptions. There are a lot of uh, conservative legal scholars who suggest that the proper guide for the post for constitutional interpretation is called original intent. Determine the original intent of the framers. Now, strictly speaking, that is not textualism. Scalia and Thomas on the US Supreme Court are textualists. They rely on the words of the text, the words in the actual document and not necessarily the intent of the framers who wrote those words. A judge, according to a textualist, should attach primary importance to the words and not necessarily to the intent. And Scalia summed it up very succinctly. He said, and I'm quoting, it's the law that governs, not the intent of the lawgiver. Now, the reason there's some confusion is because textualists are also known as originalists. And what that means is that you interpret the text in a manner that it would have been interpreted when the words were originally crafted and ratified, not in accordance with a meaning that attaches to the words under a modern uh, conception of those words. So it's original meaning, but that is not the same as original intent. Original meaning focuses on the words. Original intent focuses on the values and the objectives of the drafters and the ratifiers when they enacted a particular provision. And you can imagine the difficulty in applying a concept like original intent. Uh, the first uh, important question, almost unresolvable question, is which drafters or ratifiers are authoritative in terms of determining uh, their original intent. Uh, as I'm going to mention in just a moment, Madison and Hamilton had vastly different views about the meaning of certain provisions in the Constitution. So whose views? should you look to in determining original intent? And furthermore, how do we know what their views were? There was only one guy who kept notes about the Constitutional Convention, and that was Madison. So we have only his input to determine what the original intent of the framers might have been. 
Now, you may have heard another term associated with the conservatives that also I think is a bit misleading. And that is, conservatives are said to be strict constructions. Uh, that, too, is not the same as textualism. Um, Scalia, again, explained the difference. This is what he said. I'm not a strict constructionist, and no one ought to be. A text should not be construed strictly. It should not be construed loosely. It should be construed reasonably to contain all that it fairly means. So suppose you wanted to interpret a constitution that was ratified in 1789. What would be the very best uh, tool that you would have at your disposal? The best tool would be a dictionary. A dictionary that was available in 1789, a contemporaneous dictionary that would explain the meaning of the words. And it would explain the meaning of those words, defining those words not strictly and not loosely, but reasonably, in accordance with their actual meaning uh, at, um, at the time. So that's pretty much textualism, the reliance of the words on the words in uh, the document. And you've heard this other theory called the living constitution. That's the polar opposite of textualism, and it's a theory preferred by many of today's liberals, uh, particularly on the Supreme Court, um, Justice uh, Stephen Breyer. And he thinks the Constitution should be interpreted uh, in light of new circumstances, sort of a malleable document that can be molded, can be changed so that it's flexible. And here's the way he described it. A living Constitution is one designed to provide a framework for government across the centuries, a framework that is flexible enough to meet modern needs. And then he goes on to say, our constitutional system requires structural flexibility sufficient to adapt substantive laws and institutions to rapidly changing social, economic, and technological conditions. Now, the textualist response to that is that there's nothing wrong with structural flexibility, but after all, the framers provided a means to provide structural flexibility. It's in Article 5 of the Constitution. It's the amendment process. If the Constitution needs to be changed, if it needs to be structurally flexible, then amend it. And in fact, we have done so 17 times plus the 10 First Amendments in the Bill of Rights, or a total of 27 times. What you cannot do is to treat this Constitution as if it's uh, so much, uh, if it's so much uh, tissue paper that the document doesn't mean uh, what it says. Indeed, what is the purpose of having a written document, according to the textualist, uh, if you're going to act as though it's just a piece of paper? Now, the important thing to note here is that reliance on the text of the Constitution, as it was ratified in 1789, does not mean, and this is something that's misinterpreted by the media in particular, it does not mean that the document is frozen in time and that it can't be adapted to modern circumstances. For example, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. I don't know of any textualists who would say that the First Amendment doesn't protect the Internet. Of course, the framers could never have imagined that we would have anything like an internet. It is always permissible to examine the trajectory of the words and apply those words to modern circumstances. The thing that is not permissible is to treat those words as if they mean something quite opposite to what they clearly meant at the time they were ratified. The Constitution is not locked into a 1789 framework. But it does get interpreted in accordance with the words that are actually uh, in the document. Now, where does our president stand on all of this? Well, I think we got a pretty good idea. Um, I should start by saying that near term, unless something unpredictable happens to one of the four conservatives on the court, or Justice Kennedy who gets to be the swing vote, it's not likely that President Obama is going to have a major impact on the makeup, of the ideological makeup of the uh, of the Supreme Court. Now, if he serves for another four years, that could change because Scalia and, and Kennedy will be uh, close to 80 years old at the end of that four-year term, and they may be in the mood to retire. But so far, what we've had is liberal justice, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, appointed by Obama, who's replaced liberal justice David Souter, and we've had liberal justice Elena Kagan, appointed by Obama, to replace liberal justice uh, <coughs> Stevens. So it's a liberal for a liberal, and has an effect on the ideological mix. And ditto if uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg retires. Reportedly, she's not in good health, although she keeps saying she's going to stay in the court for quite a while. Uh, if she retires, she will be replaced by uh, Obama with another liberal. And that, too, will not change 
right, the ideological mix of, of the court. So unless something happens to the four conservatives, Alito, Roberts, Thomas, or Scalia, or Justice Kennedy and Swain vote, again, it's not likely that Obama will affect the mix on the, the Supreme Court. That does not mean that he has no effect on the courts. The Supreme Court is one court. There are uh, lots of other courts, and George W. and Clinton, each of whom served two terms, as you know, they appointed each of them about 300 judges on the lower courts, the appellate courts and the trial courts. 300 judges each that he appointed. And to put all that in perspective, <laughs> the uh, Supreme Court handles about 75 cases a year. 75 cases a year. The appellate courts uh, handle about 3,000 cases a year. There are 12 appellate courts, 3,000 cases a year only 75 of which ever get up to the Supreme Court. So 2,925 out of 3,000 cases, the appellate court is the final word on those, on those cases. So it makes an awful lot of difference who's serving on that, uh, those appellate courts. And of course, the appellate courts tend to be feeders to the Supreme Court. So Obama definitely will have, or he has had, and will have, of course, if he serves another four years, an enormous uh, impact on the makeup of the lower courts, even if he doesn't get uh, Supreme Court uh, appointments. What type of judges is he likely uh, to nominate? Well, we have a pretty good idea from his uh, nomination so far. What he has said is, this is a quote, I believe that our courts should stand up for social and economic justice. I want judges to have the empathy to recognize what it's like to be a teenage mom or gay or poor or black. Now, there, there are a lot of liberal legal scholars who adopt that formulation, although they they use other labels, such as the living constitution, as sort of synonyms for empathy and a social uh, consciousness. The, the textualist response is that empathy is certainly a desirable characteristic. Nobody would suggest that we don't want judges who are empathetic. The question is whether their empathy trumps the words that are written in the constitution as a basis for interpreting uh, that, that document. So if you like the notion of a living constitution that can be sort of bent by uh, empathetic judges, who have a social consciousness, then the Obama's judicial nominees are going to be your cup of tea. Uh, but if you prefer originalists, textualists, who are anchored by the written word of the founding documents, then you've got to gird your loins uh, during an Obama administration. And I think there's, there's a major, one major reason for this broken judicial confirmation process. If you've ever watched a Supreme Court justice or even an intelligent being confirmed, you know that the confirmation process is dysfunctional. And if you've ever wondered why it's dysfunctional, I think one major reason is that we have, over a long period of time, gradually moved away from the textual view of the Constitution toward this living Constitution uh, view. And when the text of the written Constitution is trumped uh, by evolving societal needs and empathy, then uh, the judicial function is just politics by another name. So no wonder Congress and the various activists activist groups on both sides of the aisle are so concerned about a nominee's views on public policy uh, issues because those views could ultimately become law, notwithstanding that there are words in the Constitution that provide uh, exactly the contrary. And that's what happens when a malleable Constitution allows judges to act as if they were uh, legislators. So that's a little bit of background about constitutional interpretation. Now I want to talk about a couple of cases that I think have been particularly destructive. But let me start by saying that it's been uh, 220 years since the Bill of Rights uh, was ratified in 1791, and, and as I mentioned, it's only been amended after that. That was the first 10 amendments. Uh, 17 more times, that's quite extraordinary. 220 years we've only had 17 amendments. Uh, even though the framers could never have imagined what our 21st century world would look like. So why is it that we've had so few amendments? Uh, most other countries, it, not only haven't they had 17 amendments, they probably had 17 or more constitutions. Whole constitution to the place. Well, there, there are a lot of reasons why our document has been much more stable. Uh, I think three of them are particularly relevant to uh, the, the talk tonight. Two of the reasons are good ones, and one is not so good. Uh, the first good reason that there have only been 17 amendments in about 200 years is that the framers were geniuses. And they had this vision of liberty that's every bit as relevant today that it was back in, in 1789. Uh, and so he, they wrote this incredible document. The second good reason is in exercising their genius, they had the foresight to include the Article 5 process for amending the Constitution 
and they made it very difficult. So essentially, to amend the Constitution, two-thirds of both houses have to propose amendments, and then they have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. And not surprisingly, that hasn't happened uh, very often, and as a result, we have a, uh, a substantial stable framework, constitutional framework. Now, there is this one bad reason, and that is that uh, the Supreme Court has accomplished through the back door what uh, the Congress and the states, uh, I don't think, could have accomplished through the prescribed amendment process. Uh, regrettably, the modern Supreme Court has, over a period of decades, mostly since the New Deal, has lost its compass, and I think that has uh, profound implications for all of us, and that's, uh, that's going to be the subject that I address. Some of that damage occurred very early on. So the, pro probably the worst case you've ever heard of is the Dred Scott versus Sanford 1857 case where uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney uh, held, among other things, that black slaves uh, were not citizens of the United States, indeed they were property. Uh, and then in 1890, in another racially charged case, Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, the court upheld a Louisiana statute uh, that not only permitted, but required railroads to provide separate but equal accommodations uh, for the white and colored races. So as repugnant as those cases were, uh, the reason I'm not going to talk about them very much tonight is because they're no longer the law of the land. Uh, happily, uh, Scott was superseded, Dred Scott was superseded by the 14th Amendment in 1868, and, and as you know, Plessy v. Ferguson was overruled by a series of cases, uh, most importantly the school desegregation case, Brown v. Board of Education uh, in 1954. So much of the court's real mission uh, occurred uh, late during the New Deal. <coughs> and continues uh, today. So it's that period from 1934, the beginning of the New Deal today, uh, that uh, is going to be the focus. So here are just a few of the cases. And what's important about these are, they're not in any particular order, it's not the most destructive, but the least destructive. These are just a few of the cases. What's important about them is how much uh, they pertain to what's going on today as we read the paper from day to day. They have enormous relevance, even though if you haven't been to law school, you probably never heard of these cases, maybe one or two. Uh, but most of you haven't heard of these cases. They have enormous relevance with respect to uh, uh, today's uh, issues. And of course, uh, the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room is health care, right? That's an issue that the Supreme Court just decided uh, it's going to review. The Florida case uh, that the 11th Circuit declared Obamacare to be uh, partly unconstitutional, the mandate that says you have to buy insurance or pay a penalty. Uh, that case is going to be reviewed by the Supreme Court. It's going to be uh, oral argument probably in around March, and we probably have a decision in June, which puts it right in the middle of the presidential election. It's a key case. It determines whether there are going to be any limits whatsoever uh, left on federal government power. So what, what, what's the government claiming? And it goes back to a couple of these cases. Uh, one issue, um, <clears throat> that one, one provision of the Constitution that the government is invoking is called the taxing power. And it's sometimes called the general welfare Specifically, it says that the federal government has the power to tax in order to provide uh, for the general welfare. And this was tested in a case back in 1937 uh, called Helbrey v. Davis. And the issue in Helbrey v. Davis is very closely related to the constitutionality of Obamacare. The issue in that case was whether or not the Social Security system uh, was constitutional. You have to think like a judge. So it is not whether the Social Security system is a good idea. It's not whether it's actuarially sound. It's not whether you should have more control over your finances. Uh, it's not whether folks like me enjoy receiving uh, their check uh, in the mail every month. Those are interesting questions, but that's not the question for a judge of the Supreme Court. The question for a judge is where in the Constitution do you find authority for the federal government to tell us how we have to provide for our retirement? And if you ask the proponents of the Social Security system, they said it's in the general welfare clause, the power to tax in order to provide for the general welfare. And this became a battle between Hamilton and Madison, a perfect illustration of what would be wrong if you tried to apply original intent, because they did not agree as to what the original intent was with respect to the taxing power. So here's what Hamilton said. Hamilton said, we've got all these powers for the federal government listed in the Constitution. And they're mostly in Article 1, Section 8. And if you look at them, they things like the power to establish post offices, to declare war, to coin money, to regulate interstate commerce. There's 18 of them listed in Article 1, uh, Section 8. The very first power 
there is the power to tax in order to provide for the general welfare. And, that, and Hamilton said, this is an extra added power. It's over and above the other 18 that are listed there. So Congress can tax in order to do anything that provides for the general welfare. It doesn't have to be in order to do things that are connected with declaring war or regulating commerce or establishing post offices and on and on. Madison said that cannot be the case. The whole idea behind the Constitution was to establish a government of limited and enumerated powers. Everything can be characterized as providing for the general welfare, and if the federal government can tax in order to provide for the general welfare, the federal government can do whatever it wishes. And Madison even went a step further. He said, not only is it the power to tax to provide for the general welfare, not only is it not an extra power, it's actually a restriction on the U.S. Congress. What it means, said Madison, is that when Congress exercises its other 18 powers, it has to jump through one more hoop. It can only exercise even those limited powers in a manner that promotes the general welfare and not the welfare of what Madison called factions and what we today call the special interests. So that was the debate. The Supreme Court took a look at the case, and to make a long story short, Hamilton wins, Madison loses. That opened the floodgates uh, through which the redistributive state was ready to pour, taking money from some people, giving it to other people, without any constitutional constraints. The Social Security system was declared to be perfectly constitutional. And if, if that case is invoked, the Obamacare suit, then Obamacare too is going to be declared perfectly constitutional. There is very little difference between the tax used to finance Social Security, the tax used to finance Medicare, and the payment that says if you don't buy insurance, you have to pay some money into the federal government that finances much of Obamacare. There's one big difference, however. That is, the payment in Obamacare was not called a tax. It was called a penalty. And the frame and the, the crafters of the Obamacare legislation, they knew very well the difference between a tax and a penalty. They used the term tax plenty of other places in that legislation. But when it came to the mandate, what you have to pay if you don't buy health insurance, they didn't call it a tax. They called it a penalty. Why? Well, in part because Obama had promised us over and over and over again that there would be no new taxes on the middle class. And this quite clearly is a payment that's leveled. Uh, on the middle class. So it was not called a tax. It did not function as a tax. As a matter of fact, you know, taxes are intended to raise revenue. And if this penalty worked exactly as it's crafted, as it's intended to, it would raise not a dime. Its purpose is not to raise revenue. The administration don't want people to pay that penalty. They want them to go out and buy insurance. The purpose of that penalty is not to raise revenue, as is the purpose of most, of most, uh, of most taxes. Every court that's considered this, with the exception of one, has declared that this is a penalty and not a tax. And that's why the taxing power argument, the case that I mentioned, Albert B. Davis, hasn't been invoked by the lower courts. But the Supreme Court agreed to address that issue, indicating that the Supreme Court does consider that it's an open question. And if Obamacare is justified as a tax in order to provide for the general welfare, I don't think there's much question. It will be declared constitutional. If, however, it's considered to be a penalty, or another technical argument that I'm not going to get into, if it's declared to be a tax but not a constitutional tax, because taxes are either income taxes, excise taxes, direct taxes, and it doesn't qualify as any of those, and if it passes those tests, then it will be constitutional. Now, what's the second argument and the major argument for Obamacare? It is that Obamacare is justified in the regulation of interstate commerce. And it's quite clear, explicitly in the Constitution, that the federal government does have the power to regulate interstate commerce. And this is the major uh, claim of the administration because they understand that the tax claim is a fairly weak argument, and no court other than one court has gone along with the tax claim argument. So mostly, they're relying on this power to regulate interstate commerce. And the case that's key to the administration's uh, contention is a case in 1942 called Worker v. Filbert. And really uh, interesting uh, case. And uh, the issue in Wicker v. Pilburn is whether Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce, which is set out quite clearly in the Constitution, extends to activities that are not interstate and not commerce. 
And it sounds like the answer ought to be self-evident. I mean, how could it? You know, interstate commerce doesn't mean not interstate and not commerce. <clears throat> but that wasn't clear enough for the Supreme Court. Wickard B. Filburn, Mr. Filburn grew wheat on his farm during the Depression. He didn't buy the wheat he grew. He didn't sell the wheat he ate or he gave it to his farm animals. The Roosevelt administration came in and said, you know, the price of agricultural products during the Depression is really pretty low, and we really have to boost the economy by raising the price of agricultural products. And we've studied economics in the Roosevelt administration, and we know that if you want to raise the price of something, you have to cut the supply. So, Mr. Philburn, you can't produce as much as you've been producing. You've got to cut back. And Philburn says, under what authority is the federal government telling me how much wheat I can grow? And the administration, the Roosevelt administration, said, we're regulating interstate commerce. And Philburn says, well, guess what? It's not interstate. It's all on my farm in one state. And furthermore, there's no commerce involved. I'm not uh, growing, I'm not buying this stuff and growing it, and I'm not selling it, and I'm eating it. The Supreme Court said, essentially, Filburn, you just don't get it. Uh, if you weren't out there growing this stuff, you would have had to buy it. And if you didn't eat everything you grew, you would have had some left over to sell. So by not buying it and not selling it, uh, and when you consider it, a lot of other people doing the same thing you're doing, Clearly, in the aggregate, your activities are having a substantial effect on the supply and demand for wheat, and some of which affects the price on the interstate market. And so, the federal government can regulate you under the Commerce Clause. Now, that opened up a second set of floodgates, in this case, not the redistributive state, but the regulatory state. <clears throat> Regulating anything and everything uh, under the rubric of the uh, Commerce Clause. And, uh, this case, where Gerby Filburn paved the way for what I consider to be the noxious notion that Congress and the federal government can even punish the failure for you to purchase a product from a private company, namely health insurance. And that is unprecedented. As you may know, under current law, it is illegal to buy health insurance across state lines. So there is no interstate market uh, to be regulated. Uh, nonetheless, that will be uh, the claim. If this individual mandate is upheld, it will extend the dominion of the federal government uh, to all manner of human conduct, including non-conduct. That will be the legacy of Wickard B. Filber in the 1942 uh, case. Third case, again, with uh, interesting implications for the financial crisis. And this is a case in 1934 called Home Building and Loan Association versus Blasdale. And it's about the contract clause. The Constitution, and this is the clause that is crystal clear. Quote, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. And the Supreme Court didn't think that was clear enough either. And the court upheld, in this case, some building loan, a Minnesota statute that, see if this sounds familiar, <clears throat> postponed mortgage payments for financially troubled homeowners. Uh, never mind the contract. And of course, we're seeing a replay of that as financially troubled uh, homeowners are, uh, and their lenders are being pressured to waive uh, foreclosure rights on mostly subprime mortgages and some others. Now, bear in mind, we're not talking about mortgage contracts that were fraudulently induced. There are plenty of laws on the books that cover that, and they're often do. They are not enforceable. We're not talking about mortgage contracts where the, the foreclosure process was inadequately documented, where the paperwork was not sufficient, didn't comply with the law. That, too, is covered by the existing laws. What we're talking about are mortgages that were extended to individuals who understood the risks involved, who probably knew, at least in many cases, that should there be adverse developments in the real estate market, they wouldn't be able to cover these risks, who nonetheless went ahead, borrowed the money, the lenders went ahead and lent the money, thinking that they had the security of the home as uh, protection, and now the lenders are being told that they should waive uh, foreclosure. Uh, rights. And that will be the legacy of this 1934 case, Home Building Among Association for Supplies. Uh, another case uh, having implications, even more serious implications for the financial uh, crisis is the case involving the doctrine that nobody uh, even recalls. Even in law school, they don't study this very much because the Supreme Court has pretty much rendered it a dead letter. It's called the non delegation doctrine. And that doctrine says, it stems from the very first sentence in the Constitution right after the preamble. 
very first sentence says all legislative power is vested in Congress. Now, as I mentioned, the framers were pretty smart guys. So the reason they did that is because they knew if Congress passes laws that we don't like, we have a remedy. We can vote the bums out of office. The problem is, suppose Congress passes laws that nobody knows what they mean, or to take a modern <coughs> a modern amendment. They don't even read it. That happens. And then they turn the power to flesh out the details of the law over to one of the 320 administrative agencies, alphabet agencies, SEC, FEC, FEC, CAB, ICC, you name it. 320 alphabet agencies that are not part of the legislative branch in Washington, D.C. They tell the legislative agencies, you have the power to pass, to flesh out the details of these laws. These legislative, these executive agencies and administrative agencies that are not part of the legislature become effectively lawmaking agencies, even though the Constitution says all lawmaking power is vested in the US uh, Congress. So when you turn over power to these agencies, the voters don't have any remedy anymore because these agencies are run by unelected bureaucrats, not by elected representatives. So the voters can't do anything about it, and the courts apparently are not going to do anything about it either. If you like this delegation of legislative authority to these alphabet agencies, even though it's quite clearly proscribed by the Constitution, then you will love the bailout. You will love TARP, the Troubled Asset uh, Relief uh, Program, which basically turned U.S. lawmaking power over to Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson and then his successor, Treasury Secretary uh, Timothy Dyke. So Paulson is given legislative power and he says, you know, we're going we're gonna to purchase toxic assets from these troubled banks. The federal government's going to step in and buy the assets. Several weeks later, he, he did that with any guidance, no guidance from Congress whatsoever. <coughs> Several weeks later, he changed his mind. He says, no, if we decided that's not going to work, we're going to inject capital directly into these institutions. We're actually going to give them money so that they can continue, continue to operate. Then Dyke comes along, and he decides neither one of those ideas is particularly good. What we really need is a public-private partnership. And by that, he meant that the public, that's all of us, the taxpayers, we pay all the costs. And the private, that's the big banks, they make all the money. That's the public-private uh, partnership. Again, all of this done without any congressional input. And along the way, <clears throat> the federal government expropriates $180 billion to bail out insurance giant AIG and a few tens of billions of dollars to bail out the automobile companies, even though there's an express, express statement by Congress that there'd be no funds to be used to bail out uh, automobile companies. And what have the courts said about all this? Well, we know that the Constitution says you're not supposed to do this, but you know government uh, is a pretty complicated business nowadays, particularly in a financial crisis, and so uh, we're going to have to make an exception. And the exception is this. As long as Congress crafts an intelligible principle so that the agencies know how to flesh out the details of the law, we're going to allow the delegation of legislative power to these administrative agencies. So ask yourself, what was the intelligible principle that uh, Paulson and Geithner uh, had to follow? And the answer is, uh, nobody has a foggy side. Least of all the taxpayers who are putting the bill. Uh, the intelligible principle seems to be, make things better. And that is not a, a coherent guide to, uh, <coughs> to uh, legislative action. The next case is one that you've uh, You've probably uh, heard, of, and that is a case called Korematsu versus the United States, 1944 case in the middle of World War II. Uh, three months after the December 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, FDR issued an executive order, and what that did was it gave specified military commanders the authority to uh, exclude persons from designated areas that presumably had some military. A significance. Well, Fred Korematsu was one of these excluded guys. He was an American citizen of Japanese descent, but he violated the exclusion order. He decided the federal government didn't have the power to keep him out of these areas. And as a result, he was sent to um, what was euphemistically called a relocation center by the Roosevelt administration, but it was described by Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts as a concentration camp, probably a more accurate description. Uh, no question was ever raised regarding Korematsu's loyalty uh, to the United States. He's never been to Japan. 
He didn't claim Japanese citizenship. He didn't read Japanese. He spoke uh, Japanese only, uh, only uh, whole. And over the next two years, 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans, 70,000 of them were U.S. citizens. Uh, they were confined to these internment camps. Not one of the 120,000 victims uh, was convicted of espionage or sabotage or even disloyalty to the United States. And by the end of the war, uh, Japanese Americans had received 18,000 declarations of valor fighting for the United States. It wasn't until the middle of 1946 uh, that the last of these guys was returned uh, to their homes. So the Supreme Court took a look at this. And the decision was written by Justice Hugh Bill Black, a renowned uh, civil libertarian on the court. And he invoked national security and absolved the Roosevelt administration of any blame. There was a dissent, there were a couple of dissents, but one by Justice Frank Murray that was particularly powerful. And this is what he wrote. The internment of Japanese Americans goes over the very brink of constitutional power and falls into the ugly abyss of racism. Every charge against these Jap Japanese Americans has been substantially discredited. And then finally, in 1983, 40 years later, the Commission on Wartime Justice found unanimously that, and again I'm quoting, Roosevelt's executive order was not justified by military necessity, was the product of race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And five years later, uh, President Ronald Reagan, no soft touch when it comes to national security, uh, authorized reparations of $20,000 each to the surviving internees, including uh, Fred Korematsu. And in 1999, uh, Clinton uh, gave Korematsu, awarded Korematsu the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, the nation's highest uh, civilian uh, honor. So if you think that this indefinite detention of folks that are U.S. citizens went out in World War II, uh, <clears throat> have another look. Uh, consider the more current case of Jose Padilla, who was a U.S. citizen seized on the streets of Chicago and confined to solitary confinement for the better part of five years. No charges filed for that period of time, no visitation with anybody, no legal counsel, no access to lawyers. Ultimately, he's convicted on, on criminal charges, uh, but those charges were filed only after the Supreme Court uh, seemed poised to order his uh, relief. And those criminal charges had very little to do with what he was initially said to have done, and that is to threaten our, our cities with a dirty bomb. Now, I'm not a, an apologist for Jose Padilla. I think he was a pretty bad guy. And he may have deserved a lot worse than what he received. Uh, but we do have a rule of law in this country. And at a minimum, you would think that it means that Americans cannot be seized. American citizens cannot be seized off the streets of a US city and whisked away and incarcerated and definitely held incommunicado and, and given no chance to argue that, uh, that they were mistakenly uh, detained. And I'm sorry to say that uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, not only claimed authority to uh, detain U.S. citizens without charge, he did claim that authority, but he also claimed authority to engage in electronic surveillance without a warrant, uh, to convene military tribunals without any congressional approval, to establish some of these secret uh, CIA camps, to declare that all battlefield detainees are enemy combatants, even though some of them, quite clearly, were innocent and others of them were prisoners of war, and to employ some interrogation techniques that we know now probably uh, violated our treaty commitments against uh, torture. So Korematsu, this case, set the stage. It's not that the courts today invoke uh, Korematsu to justify this kind of executive power. This case is pretty well uh, an inaccurate. It, it hasn't been formally overruled by the Supreme Court, but it's been overruled in the court of history even if it hasn't been officially uh, repudiated. Uh, but Korematsu's challenge, if it had been upheld, uh, would have stood, I think, as a formidable barrier to excessive concentrations of power uh, in the executive branch of government. Instead, uh, the court condoned Roosevelt's, I think, unconstitutional internment policy and passed up its chance uh, to establish legal precedent that might have deterred uh, future executive uh, misbehavior. There's an interesting story about uh, national security and civil liberties involving uh, former Attorney General John Ashcroft <coughs> related to this, uh, this case. Ashcroft's lecturing on 
National Security and Civil Liberties to uh, an elementary school class, and he finishes and he decides to he'll take questions from the audience. Little Julie, and a little Timmy in the back of the room stands up and says, General Ashcroft, I got two, two questions. He says, Well, what are they, Timmy? Timmy says, Well, where are the weapons of destruction uh, in, in Iraq? And, uh, and how come you're using the Patriot Act to violate our civil liberties? And just then the bell goes off and the kids go running out to play. And they play for about 20 minutes and they come back in and Ashcroft graciously is to stay there and agree to answer the questions. <clears throat> so this time it's not Timmy in the back of the room, it's little Julie in front of the room. She stands up and she says, I have uh, four questions for you, General Ashcroft. Uh, where are the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Uh, how come you're using the Patriot Act to violate our civil liberties? Uh, why is it that the bell went off uh, 20 minutes early? And where is Timmy? <laughs> I don't mean to suggest that that's a, a true story, and I have great respect for uh, General Ashcroft, but I think it does say something about uh, the Bush administration's policies, some of the policies, uh, on civil liberties. Uh, this next case is a little bit uh, less uh, momentous, but it's, uh, I think, stark nonetheless. It's a case, a more recent case, 1996 called Venice v. Michigan. And here are the facts which are extraordinary. Mrs. Venice owns a car. And it's her car, and her husband takes it without her consent. And without her knowledge, she wasn't even aware of it. She goes, he goes out and picks up the prostitute, and he has sex in the car. And uh, he gets arrested, and the prostitute, the prostitute gets arrested, and the car gets arrested. And Mrs. Venice wants her car back. She says, my car. He took the car without my consent. If I'd known about it, I wouldn't have consented. And after all, I'm the victim of this deal. He's my husband. He got out and accepted the prostitute. The prostitute. And the government said, Michigan government said, sorry, Mr. Venice, uh, this, this car is connected with the commission of a crime. And, uh, there is no innocent owner defense under the statute. This is called civil asset forfeiture. It has three parts to it, two of which are understanding. You can keep assets if they are first contraband. That is, things that are illegal in and of themselves. So if you, if you are in the counterfeiting business, then clearly if the government finds out about it, they can keep your plates, your counterfeit plates. You can also keep assets of what are called ill-gotten gains. So if I take the counterfeit plates and I sell them to one of you and get a thousand bucks for them, and the government finds out, they can keep a thousand bucks. So none of that's very controversial. But the third part of this is what's called the facilitation doctrine. The government gets to keep any asset that facilitates the commission that's what Mrs. Venice's car did, facilitated the commission of the crime. The government argued the crime would not have occurred were it not for the fact uh, that Mrs. Venice's car was available to Mr. Venice. Now, the law has changed a little bit. The federal law now requires um, higher level proof, and it gives the owner of the asset an innocent owner defense. If the owner didn't know that the car was being used for this illicit purpose, then the car can't be confiscated. A lot of the states have not changed their law. Why? Well, because the war on drugs is the major use of these civil asset forfeiture laws, and the seizing of these assets and reselling them furnishes an enormous amount of money to the law enforcement departments, the police departments, which you can appreciate these, these departments are frequently underfunded. They don't have sufficient resources because they can't pay for them. And so this is one source of funding. But of course, that's not a justification for allowing this kind of unconscionable seizure of assets from innocent people. And yet, those laws are still on the books in a very large uh, number of, uh, of cases. How much time do we have? As much as you need. OK, how many other two, three hours? Yeah, uh, how much time do you want? I'll do, I'll do two, two more cases, not, not very long. Maybe one. Let's see how long it takes. This case, again, I think you, you may have heard of. Uh, this is a case, a, re a recent case, the most recent case that I'm going to talk about. It's 2005. It's a case called Kilo versus City of Dubai, and it's all about the use of eminent domain. Now, eminent domain is something that is provided for in the Constitution. It says in the Fifth Amendment you can take a private property as long as you pay just compensation and as long as it's for public use. So suppose you have this cherished home you've lived in for a long time, and this is Mrs. Suzette Kilo's home up in New London, Connecticut. And along comes a private developer, and he goes to the city of New London, and he says, you know, I know these folks are living here, but, you know, I can do a lot more with their property than they're doing. They're just living in it. I know some folks over at Pfizer, and they're going to put a big pharmaceutical plant, and along with the pharmaceutical plant, we're going to have an office building and some hotels, 
And that's really going to be good for the community because what we're going to do is expand the tax base. I mean, how much tax do you collect from private residents? And not only expand the tax base, we're going to create a bunch of jobs. And so they went, this private developer goes to the city of New London and says, let me, let me have Mrs. Kilo's home and the homes of all our neighbors in, in this particular area. And the city of New London actually condemns the home under the pride of the power of the domain. And Mrs. Kilo says, wait, wait a minute. What about the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution? It says you can do this, but it says only take private property for public use. It's not public use to go to some guy who knows a Pfizer pharmaceutical executive who's willing to put up a private plan, nor is it a public use to have an office building or a hotel, which is run by private parties. Or nearly public use, you, you think of public use, it means roads, it means military bases, it means schools. It doesn't mean pharmaceutical plants and hotels and office buildings. The Supreme Court again said, you know, Mrs. Kilo, uh, interesting claim, but we know that the Constitution says public use, but we're not going to interpret it that way. We're going to interpret it as public benefit, public purpose. So if there's a public purpose served, even if it's not a public use, then we're going to allow this. And after all, expanding the tax base and, and providing for jobs, that's a public purpose. And so Mrs. Kilo's program, uh, home, was, was uh, condemned and relocated. And so were her neighbors' uh, homes. And so if the criteria is that uh, whenever jobs are created or whenever the tax base is expanded, your home can be taken from you, then nobody's home is safe from the government bulldozer. Now, fortunately, there's an epilogue. And that is <clears throat> the law firm that lost the case, Institute for Justice, in the Supreme Court, on whose board I'm happy to sit, um, took this case to a different venue, uh, the Court of Public Opinion. And as a result of the Kilo case, there was a greater outcry among the public than I think any case since Roe v. Wade, uh, the abortion case. And after that outcry, there are now 43 states that have passed statutes that have trumped the Supreme Court's decision with respect to state law. Obviously, you can't trump, the state can't trump uh, federal law. But with respect to state law, they have reined in the use of economic development, of, of eminent domain for purposes of economic development. And therein lies uh, two lessons. The first of which is that there are more than one way to win a lawsuit. So you can lose in the Supreme Court. Of course, you can't go any higher than that. But you can approach the Court of Public Opinion, the second court, and with a good media crusade, you can get legislative relief. And that's what the Institute for Justice did. They got legislative relief in 43 states. The second lesson is that the states can always give you more protection for your rights than the federal government. The U.S. Constitution sets a floor and not a ceiling. And if a state wants to come in and under state law, again, they can't do it under federal law, but if a state wants to come in under state law and give you more protection against having your home condemned and taken from you, the state uh, can, uh, can uh, do that. One other interesting fact about this case uh, if you tour the area of New London, Connecticut, you will not find Suzette Kilo's home or the home of her neighbors because they were all taken and transported elsewhere. Uh, you also will not find the Pfizer plant or the hotel or the commercial office building, none of which ever uh, materialized. Um, as a matter of fact, Pfizer has since closed a nearby facility because it became economically unproductive. Uh, so much for uh, economic uh, development. So to conclude, uh, in a free society, uh, we shouldn't permit government to turn uh, our homes over to private developers, and we shouldn't be forced to buy health insurance, and we shouldn't be compelled to bail out automobile companies. Uh, but those abuses of, of government power can be minimized only if the courts uh, ensure that the legislative and the executive branches are bound by the chains of the Constitution. That was the purpose of the Constitution, to bind the legislative and executive branches with chains to stop them from exercising powers uh, that are not authorized. And regrettably, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, occasionally been derelict in fulfilling that uh, obligation. So I hope that uh, explanation hasn't been too technical or, or, or legalistic. I remember uh, when I went to law school, which I did, by the way, in my 50s, so I was 
got old when I went to law school. Uh, there was a case in the class, a class that we had to take on quarantine methods for lawyers. And the professor said, how do you, how do you come up? I have a tall building using nothing but a thermometer. So I knew it involved the factory engineering to set up the thermometer and look at the angle of the sun and measure the length of the shadow and extrapolate and try to estimate the height of the building. But while I'm figuring all of this out, some guy in the back of the room raises his hand, probably parking him. He said, why don't you find the owner of the building and tell him to tell you how tall it is and give him a free thermometer. So that's it. <laughs> there is a virtue. In, uh, there is a virtue in, uh, in, uh, in, in simplicity. And so I've tried to avoid some of these legal uh, complexities, knowing that uh, most of these things, all of them, um, are non uh, lawyers. So we have some time now for uh, questions and answers. And uh, if we run out of time, I may have to dispense with the answers. First of all, uh, I want to thank you for your excellent presentation. I, I truly enjoyed it. I've spoken to uh, a dozen students already, and uh, my question was, did you, uh, did you enjoy it? And the answer was yes, and did you follow it? And the answer was yes. So that's just excellent. Thank you. And we have some good questions that were uh, posed, and I'm going to try to take them uh, in order, if I can. Um, why is the call for separate and unequal tax rates for the rich not called discrimination and class bigotry? Progressive taxation. Well, there is, of course, the 16th Amendment, which has <coughs> authorized the income tax. Prior to the 16th Amendment, there was considerable question as to whether the income tax was authorized. Post the 16th Amendment, there's no question but that the income tax is constitutional. There is some question as to whether a progressive tax system is constitutionally authorized, but the courts have said yes, it is. And so it seems to be a closed matter. Uh, it could be subject to challenge under the Equal Protection Clause. Technically, if you read the Constitution, there is no federal Equal Protection Clause, but the court has read an Equal Protection Clause into the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. But to the extent that that clause has been applied to challenge the progressivity of the income tax, and the courts have held that a progressive income tax is not discriminatory because, among other things, those folks who are able to pay more money are benefiting more from government services. And one obvious government service is national defense or state police power. And to the extent that you have more assets to protect, then you are benefiting the exercise of the, uh, the federal national defense. I don't find that bad to be completely compelling, but I think it's a close issue. There will be no successful challenge to the president. The questioner is asking your thoughts on the recent Supreme Court case of Citizens United, in which corporations were permitted to invest money or infuse money, sometimes large sums, into the political process. What's your view on that? Of course, way back in 2002, the federal government decided that <clears throat> money and politics shouldn't mix. And so they passed what's called the McCain Feingold Law in 2002. We know how well that worked out, right? And six years later, we had a presidential election in 2008, during which more money was spent than in any election in the history of the universe. So much for McCain Feingold. <clears throat> that law was codified. Uh, and it became known as BICRA, BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. And it was challenged in 2003, the year after it was passed, in a case called McConnell versus FEC. FEC being the Federal Election Commission, and McConnell being Mitch McConnell, who's the current Senate Majority Leader, and Senator from uh, Kentucky. And the Supreme Court in that case, McConnell versus FEC, it decided that even though the First Amendment is supposed to protect speech, and even though you would think that political speech is the most fundamental kind of speech that the First Amendment is supposed to protect, the Supreme Court upheld became final. And thus, some forms of political speech are given less protection under the First Amendment than pornography, and then flag burning, then gangster rap. All of those things, in my view, ought to be constitutionally protected, but so should political speech. And among the things that mccain final made legal <clears throat> was a provision that said, if you happen to be a corporation or a labor union and you fund any publication at all that expressly advocates the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate, 
then your publication uh, would be illegal. So if Random House, for example, a major publishing company, were to publish a book, and somewhere within the 600 pages of the book it said three words, vote for Obama, or vote against Obama, that book could be banned. So we're not supposed to be about banning books in the United States. And that's why the Supreme Court decided a few years after McConnell versus FEC to take another look. And that was the Citizens United versus FEC, again, FEC being the Federal Election Commission. And in Citizens United, they overturned, the court revisited this. And this is one of the rare instances where the court will actually overturn a prior precedent, particularly so quickly, within a few years, of establishing the precedent. In Citizens United, the court overturned the two most egregious provisions in the McCain final. And the first was the one I just mentioned. That is, in any publication funded by a corporation or a union, you may not expressly advocate the election or defeat of a named candidate. The second was even more onerous. In any publication, broadcast publication, funded by a labor union or a corporation, you may not even name a candidate. You don't have to say vote for or vote against. You don't have to say anything with respect to the election. You may not name a candidate for federal office in that publication if it's broadcast distribution. <clears throat> within 60 days of a general election or 30 days of a primary. Both of those provisions were overturned. This case, Citizens United is interesting, it was about a movie called Hillary, the movie. It was critical of Hillary Clinton. And the law read this, and you can see how absurd this is, at least I hope you can see it. You could go and watch this movie in the theater, that was okay. And you could buy this movie on DVD. But the corporation that produced the movie could not advertise that the movie was available to be seen in the theater, and could not advertise that the DVD was available to be purchased. That was the absurdity of McCain final. And when the Supreme Court considered that, it overturned those, that provision. Now, the media took this and suggested that, first, Citizens United was all about the issue of whether corporations should be treated as a person. Now that's an interesting legal question about which there is an enormous amount of legal scholarship. It has nothing to do with Citizens United. The question in Citizens United was not whether a corporation should be treated as a person. It is whether people like those of us sitting in this room have the right under the Constitution to pool our resources and express our political views in any venue that we wish. That could be a club, it could be an organization of some sort, it could be a partnership, an LLC, a corporation, or a labor union. The second misrepresentation by the media, which is kind of interesting, is it was suggested that as a result of Citizens United, and by the way, you can pick up the New York Times and read this just about any day, because they repeat it over and over again. As a result of Citizens United, millions of dollars would be flowing from the corporate coffers and the labor union coffers into the campaign of these various candidates. Not true at all. It is illegal under current law, even after that case, for any corporation or any labor union to contribute a nickel to a federal candidate for office. What is legal and what the case accomplished is that now the corporation and the labor union can pay for, out of their own coffers, broadcast ads that support uh, or uh, oppose candidates, and they can disseminate those kinds of ads uh, without restriction from the federal government, so long as they do not coordinate the ads uh, with the uh, candidate's campaign. So do we still have a money problem? Uh, maybe. If we have a big money problem, it's because we have a big government problem. So it's no wonder that lobbyists run to Washington, D.C., seeking to curry favor with the politicians. It's because the politicians have so many favors that they can give out. So if you want to get money out of politics, reduce the power of the federal government. Eliminate the amount of favors that the federal government can disseminate. And you'll get the government out of our wallets, and you'll get the government out of our bedrooms, and you'll get the corporate lobbyists out of Washington, D.C. Thank you. Okay, this is a two-part uh, do you think Obamacare will result in more bankruptcy cases? If so, with unemployment rates as high as they are, how will, uh, what, I, I guess the question is, how will people be able to pay for insurance? And if they can't pay for insurance or can't afford to pay the penalties, what do you understand will happen to them? Wow, well, that's a pretty big one. <clears throat> 
Let me start with this uh, premise, and that is that not every problem has a solution. So bad things happen sometimes. And one thing we can be sure of is that when the federal government decides they're going to cure every problem that exists, there are going to be unintended consequences, and frequently the unintended consequences are worse than the problems that the federal government sets out to cure in the, in the first place. So what should, I'm trying to circuit this, short circuit the question because this is an enormous question, uh, but what should the federal government have done to, uh, uh, to avoid uh, this mandate that everybody seems to, at least a lot of people seem to object to. The last poll I saw was something like 70 to 80 percent of the people think the mandate is a bad idea, and even over 50 percent think the whole bill from Obamacare is a bad idea. So what should the federal government have done? Well, the, the problem is, in a nutshell, that we get our medical insurance through our companies where we work. And as a result of that, uh, if we get sick, for example, and we lose our job, and we have a pre-existing condition, now we go to some other person and try to get insurance, and the insurance companies are not stupid. They're not going to cover a pre-existing condition. You know, you don't write, if you're an insurance company, you don't write insurance on a home if the, if the thing is already on fire. Uh, in the same sense, they're not going to cover pre-existing conditions. So the problem is that we are getting insurance from our employers and the insurance is not transportable. Now, why don't we have that problem when it comes to uh, term life insurance, uh, different than health insurance? We have term life insurance, we know that if the policy expires and we're already sick, the insurance company may say, hey, we're not going to renew it. You know, we're not stupid. We're not going to insure you once you're sick. So what do we do about that? We get guaranteed renewable coverage. Everybody does that. That's a normal thing in the term life insurance market. Why don't we do it in the health insurance market? Because we don't negotiate with the insurance companies. Our employer negotiates with the insurance companies, and they don't get custom-tailored products for each of us. They get a, a product that applies across the board to all uh, employees. Why do we get insurance through our employers? Because we've got this perverse tax system that allows companies to deduct the premiums against their taxable income. So insurance premiums paid by corporations are tax deductible. If we go out and pay insurance, pay premiums ourselves to get insurance, they're not tax deductible. So we have the federal government picking up part of the cost. And that's why we get insurance through our employers. That drives a wedge, actually two wedges, between the patient on the one hand and neither the doctor or the hospital on the other. The first wedge is we do not pay for medical care. The insurance company pays for medical care. The second wedge is we don't even pay for the insurance premiums. The company that we work for pays for the insurance premiums. So how do you behave if you don't pay for your medical care and you don't even pay for the insurance that covers your medical care? Obviously, you demand more medical care than you would otherwise demand. It's no secret why the cost of laser surgery has gone down, 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 and the cost of MRIs has gone up, up, up. Laser surgery is not covered by insurance. MRIs is covered by insurance. You want to get this situation fixed, just alter the tax code. Give individuals the power to deduct their premiums against their tax return. That will get the corporations out of the business of supplying medical insurance. It will make each of us responsible for getting our own medical insurance. Most of us would get insurance that has high deductible so that when we go ahead and pay out of pocket the ordinary expenses. You know, you, when you have a car, you don't get insurance against running out of gas. You pay for running out of gas, you know it's going to happen. It happens all the time. In the same sense, you only get insurance in the health business, if you have any sense, you get insurance in the health business for the things that you're not going to be able to afford, the big catastrophic injuries. That is much, much cheaper insurance and much less administrative costs associated with it, and that's why the insurance companies car charge less. But we can't do that under Obamacare. First, because the tax system makes us pay to get insurance through our companies, and second, because Obamacare tells us what the insurance policy has to contain, and it won't allow high deductible policies. So there are things that the government could have done to cure this problem, the government didn't do it, and that's part of the reason we have the problem, and it's part of the reason that, yes, there could be some more bankruptcies among insurance companies, among others. And by the way, just one other fact, and that is that a lot of people think the insurance companies are raping the consumer. If you add up the insurance company profits, all of the big insurance companies who sell health insurance is about $12 billion. We spend $2.4 trillion on health, and health costs in this country. So if you confiscated 100% of the insurance company profits, confiscate them. Just don't let them make any money at all. Take 100% tax. You're going to pay for about 45 hours worth of health care out of the year. 
45 hours. So the problem isn't the insurance industry. They may, they, they may be complicit in making the problem worse because it's not really a competitive market. We don't have, for example, interstate health care, interstate health insurance because there's a statute that says it's illegal. That would be another, I think, important uh, change in, in the law. It would be an important change in the law to have malpractice reform so that malpractice cases weren't driving up the cost of health care. But the big thing is make people responsible like they are in every other market in this country for monitoring the quality and the quantity of the care that they consume. When people pay the freight out of their own pocket or at least pay the premiums out of their pocket for the insurance companies that pay the freight. People will behave differently. Yeah. I have a question here. We're going to shift gears to Wickard versus Silbert. I'm, I'm sure one of your favorite cases. Um, okay, somebody did their homework. Uh, the Liberty Legal Foundation is the only one saying that all of Obamacare is unconstitutional due to the gross misinterpretation of the 1942 Supreme Court case of Wickard versus Filbert. Liberty Foundation is preparing an amicus brief to be filed in the case uh, to be heard in March. Can you give your thoughts on this, and is there any possibility that Wickard could be overturned at that time? And the answer to the last question, no. Wickard's not going to be overturned, uh, but it doesn't have to be overturned in order to declare Obamacare unconstitutional because Obamacare goes further than Wickard. So let me tell you just roughly the framework the court deals with right now. Um, there's no question but that Congress can regulate interstate commerce. That is commerce, which means the exchange of goods and services across state lines, interstate. There's no question that Congress can regulate that and can regulate the transportation that goes along with it, that is sending goods across state lines. <clears throat> Wickard v. Filburn went a little bit further. It said that it doesn't have to be commerce. It doesn't have to be the exchange of goods and services, the selling of goods or the buying of goods and services. It can be any economic act, and economic acts are much broader than commerce. They include mining, manufacturing, distributing, consuming, growing. So in Wickard v. Filburn, there was no buying and selling, but there was growing and there was consuming. Those were economic acts. So Wickard v. Filburn established this notion. The federal government can regulate any economic act which, in the aggregate, considering all the people who do it, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. It doesn't have to be interstate commerce itself, but it has a substantial effect. So the court said growing wheat and consuming wheat in Wicker v. Filburn had a substantial effect, and therefore the court could, uh, could uh, regulate it. Then there was a 1995 case called the United States versus Lopez about a completely different issue. It was about the possession of a gun within a thousand feet of the school. And the guy who got charged with the crime contested that and said that the federal government didn't have any power to make that a crime. The federal government said it's a regulation of interstate commerce. And the court said the mere possession of a gun does not qualify. Not only is it not economic commerce, it's not an economic act. There's no growing, there's no mining, there's no manufacturing, no distributing, no consuming, no, you name it, no buying and selling for sure. It's mere possession of a gun. And so the doctrine then got further defined. Congress can regulate interstate commerce, Congress can regulate economic acts that in the aggregate affect interstate commerce, but Congress may not regulate acts that are not economic. Now we go to the Obamacare mandate, and that is the failure to purchase insurance. Not only is it not commerce, not only is it non-economic, it is not even an act. It's a non-act. And so this goes beyond Wicker v. Phil. The, corporate, the uh, court can find Obamacare unconstitutional without declaring Wicker v. Filbert to be uh, unconstitutional. Now, on the first part of the question, I'm sorry about the length of these answers, but you know, these are complicated questions. These are good questions. Now, the first part of the question is whether or not you can, you can declare part of the bill unconstitutional, uh, and that means the entire bill is unconstitutional. This is an issue called severability. Most laws that Congress passed have a, what's called a severability clause. And what the severability clause says is if, if, if any particular provision is declared to be unconstitutional, that doesn't mean that the rest of the statute is unconstitutional. The rest of the statute can be, uh, can still stand. The court is bound by 
that severability clause if Congress has inserted one. If Congress declares that the finding of a particular provision on the Constitution doesn't have an effect on the rest of the statute, then the court will be bound by that. Congress, in passing Obamacare, had a severability clause, and they withdrew it. They took it out of the legislation. Why? Well, because they really did feel that this mandate was the linchpin of the whole piece of legislation, that without the mandate, the insurance companies are relying on the mandate. You're forcing people to buy insurance they don't want. The insurance companies profit from that, and that profit was the insurance company's subsidy to go out and cover pre-existing conditions, which they have to do under Obamacare. The insurance company must cover pre-existing conditions. The insurance company says, we're going to lose a lot of money. Obama says, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about people not buying insurance because we're going to make them buy insurance. If they don't, they're going to pay a penalty. So this was the linchpin of the whole bill, and that's why Congress took the severability clause out. And so now the court has an option. They can declare just the mandate unconstitutional and leave the rest of the statute in place, or they can decide the whole thing was an integrated package, and they're going to declare not only the mandate unconstitutional, but the rest. And actually, the lower courts have split on this, and it's going to be an interesting thing to see what the Supreme Court does. We are going to argue in our brief, the Cato Institute, that this provision is not severable, that the declaration that the mandate is unconstitutional means the whole thing's got to go. But it's an open question. I don't know about you, but I'm going to do a write-in for Dr. Levy for president. What do you think? When Bill, thank you, when Bill Buckley ran for mayor of New York, they asked him, what do you do? What's the first thing you would do if you got elected? And he said, I'd demand a recount. So that's what I would demand if I were elected. There were some other really good questions here, but we're out of time. I'm sure not only is Dr. Levy very bright, but he's also a very nice person. So I'm sure that after we formally end this lecture, that he can stay a little bit longer. And if you have a question, a burning question that you wanted to get answered and didn't get answered, I'm sure he'll address it for you. This time, I'd just like to thank Dr. Levy, and I hope that you would, too. Thank you.